Hello again, Four Lakes family. I hope you're doing well this week. It's good to be together again, and we are ready to study from the book of Acts once again. And if you are, as you are watching this, hopefully I am not in Madison right at this very moment. Uh, I'm recording this ahead of time, anticipating a trip out to Denver to attend the Bear Valley Bible Lectures. And that should start tomorrow if the Lord wills. Obviously, a lot can uh, go wrong on a trip that long. So I'm, I'm hoping as we are watching this together that I am getting ready to arrive in Denver tomorrow morning. So for those of you in the Madison area, though, I hope all of you can come together for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And I hope you can be present for class in between then at 10 as well. And for our members... Uh, please remember to use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two worship services. And please remember, guests are always welcome. If you're visiting with us, if you're hearing this, uh, feel free to just show up at one of those two services and Bible class in between. There's no need to sign up. But uh, for our members, we still appreciate that. Uh, thank you again so much for being patient with us in that. It's been an interesting couple years here, but uh, I hope that it goes well on Sunday. Uh, tonight, we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts, the book of gospel action written by Luke, the beloved physician, to a man by the name of Theophilus, just giving him a history of the early church. Uh, focusing primarily on the ministry of Peter and then the ministry of Paul. So Peter in the first roughly one-third of the book and then Paul for the remainder of the book of Acts. Uh, up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first uh, 15 chapters and we're working our way through. And we are using the ABCs of Acts as something of a memory tool. So in chapter 1, we had the ascension, the beginning of the church in chapter 2. Uh, the man who couldn't walk was carried and cured in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching in chapter uh, 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail. We had the first deacons with the question mark in chapter 6. In Acts 7, we had Stephen, the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch asking, how can I? In Acts 9, I am Jesus. In Acts 10, we had the journey to Joppa. In chapter 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In Acts 12, we had Peter liberated again. In chapter 13, we had missionaries sent out. In Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the uh, crowds that they were not gods but men. They were getting ready to sacrifice to them, thinking they were uh, two of the leading gods. In chapter 15, we had the reminder that the old law is not binding. Uh, then in chapter 16, Paul and his team pick up Timothy in Lystra and Luke in Troas, and then they head to Philippi, where they baptize Lydia and the Philippian jailer and their households. And so the summary for Acts 16 is Philippian jailer converted. Well, tonight we're moving into Acts 17, where the summary is questions answered in Athens. And we won't get to Athens until next week, so this is a little bit of a preview here, but we're moving toward Athens tonight. So questions answered in Athens. That'll be our class for next week. Before we get to Athens, we're heading to the city of Thessalonica. And so we have a map on the wall or not on the wall on the screen here. Uh, so we kind of know where we are in this journey. This is the big picture. Uh, Paul and his crew come from Jerusalem. They go through Asia Minor, picking up Timothy and Luke. They head straight over to Philippi, and then they make their way to Thessalonica. I'm zooming in just a little bit here to emphasize that Thessalonica is located in northern Greece, about 100 miles southwest of Philippi, where we were in our class last week. Thessalonica is a port city, so it's right there on the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And with so much commerce coming in through Thessalonica, this was a very important city for Paul to visit. It had a population of around 200,000. It was the second largest city in Greece at that time. So 200,000, it is not that much smaller than the city of Madison. Uh, several weeks ago, we noted that Paul generally did not spend too much time in tiny little villages in the middle of nowhere, did he? Not that those villages weren't important, not that the people there weren't worthy of the gospel. They certainly were. But Paul was in the custom of hitting the big cities. He would then establish congregations. And then I believe he expected those new churches to reach out from there. So he was more on the leading edge. Uh, this map also makes it clear where Paul is going. So later in this chapter, he will continue on to Berea. And then in next week's class, he will head down to Athens. So this kind of gives us a picture of where he's heading. And then in our class the following week, Paul will head down to Corinth. And that'll be in Acts chapter 18 in the first half of that chapter. 
but tonight we are in the city of Thessalonica. So tonight then let's pick up with Acts 17 and the first paragraph is Acts 17 verses 1 through 9. Acts 17 verses 1 through 9. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. So Paul and his team come to Thessalonica, and as their custom is, they start with the Jews, to the Jews first and also to the Greek, as Paul would go on to write later, in Romans 1, verse 16. In uh, verse 2, we find that Paul goes to the synagogue for uh, three Sabbaths in a row. So three Sabbaths, not necessarily three weeks. It could have just been 15 days, but uh, three Sabbaths in a row. And he uses those three sessions to reason with these people from the Scripture. So this is not about Paul. This is not about his experiences. This is not stories from his life. But notice this is all about the Word of God. So he's taking them back to the Scriptures. It's also reasonable. I would emphasize that. Obviously, our emotions are important when it comes to God, when it comes to accepting and obeying the Gospel. Uh, but this is not all about emotion. Paul seems to be making some logical arguments here. He is reasoning from the Scriptures. And so as I see this going down, perhaps you would read a passage from the scriptures, from the Hebrew Bible, that is, from the law, from the Psalms, from the prophets, and then he would show how those passages apply to Jesus. So this is what the Old Testament says. This is what the Psalms have to say. This is what the prophets were predicting. And then this is what we know about Jesus. And so he's pointing out the similarities. Jesus is a fulfillment of everything that we've been looking at from the word of God. And that's what we find in verse 3. He gives evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And so again, he is applying the word of God to these people. His goal is to convince them that Jesus truly is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And he does this for three Sabbaths straight, every Sabbath day. As a result of Paul's preaching, some are persuaded. Uh, sometime later, Paul actually writes a series of two letters back to this congregation. And he refers to this in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 where he says, For this reason we also constantly thank God, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. And I just love that passage. So really, just a short time later, as he writes back to these people, uh, what I just read was his summary of their acceptance of the gospel. They accepted it not as the word of men, but for the word of God, what it really is. In this passage, Luke breaks it down into three categories of those who are persuaded, the Jews, the God-fearing Greeks, and then also a number of the leading women. Um, I don't, it's not that the leading women weren't either Jews or Greeks. You kind of have to be one or the other. But there were so many women, it seems, that Luke kind of had to put them in their own category. There were that many, and it was so special. It was so important here. It was so unusual, so significant that he emphasizes this. The gospel then has a pretty good start there in the city of Thessalonica. Uh, in Philippi, it seems we just had a few people obey the gospel, didn't it? We had Lydia, her household, the jailer, his household. But then Silas and Paul are, are arrested. They're kind of run out of town, kind of pressured out of town before they can do too much. But in Thessalonica, though, they have three solid weeks, three Sabbaths, I should say, and very much is accomplished during that very brief time. A lot of people obey the gospel. Unfortunately, by the time we get to verse 5, we come back to what is now becoming a pretty familiar pattern to us. 
the Jews get jealous and they stir up the mob. If you're using the King James Version tonight, you might notice uh, one of the more unique uh, descriptions or wordings in the New Testament as the King James has Luke telling us that the Jews moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Lewd fellows of the baser sort. I have a preaching buddy at camp who appreciates the language of the KJV and uh, sometimes when I see him I will sometimes ask him whether he's seen any lewd fellows of the baser sort lately and he knows exactly what I'm saying and uh, we kind of get a kick out of that but I, th I think it's an interesting description not really uh, completely accurate in today's language um, today if I were to say the other day I ran into a lewd fellow uh, probably a little bit different interpretation of that word today than they had back in 1611 when the KJV was originally translated. But uh, as the New American Standard puts it, they, they gather up some wicked men from the marketplace. In other words, this isn't something the religious leaders can do on their own. Um, <laughs> the Pharisees, the leading scribes and all that, they're not going to go out and you know, with their pitchforks and their torches and all that, but they know people. They know some people who can, and so they outsource this. They delegate the mob action, and they know who they can get in touch with for this. Uh, it seems to me as if they perhaps might have even hired these men. That's a possibility here, in my opinion. Uh, kind of a rent-a-mob situation. They convince these men, through whatever means, financial or otherwise, to wreak havoc in the city of Thessalonica. And let's remember this for when we get to the end of verse 6. Notice who it is who's upsetting the city here. It's not Paul, is it? It's these men. It's the leading Jews who entice or hire these men to do it. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, not only do they wreak havoc in general, but notice in the second half of verse 5, they are looking for Paul and his companions. So there is a focus uh, to their chaos. They are looking for Paul and his people to do this Notice they go after one man in particular. They attack the house of Jason. Based on the context, it looks like Paul was perhaps staying at Jason's house. And so their goal is to go to Jason's house and to drag Paul and his companions out to the people. And I would notice here that they're not trying to bring Paul to court at this point, are they? As I understand it, they want to bring him out to the people. In other words, it seems to me as if they just want to take matters into their own hands, probably uh, to beat him to death. They, they failed over in Lystra, didn't they? They thought they killed him, but they didn't. And now, as I understand this passage, they plan on finishing what they had started. In verse 6, though, since they can't find Paul and Silas and the others, they're not home that day, they start dragging Jason and some of the other brothers to the city authority. So uh, now they're now putting pressure on Jason. And the first accusation is... These men who have upset the world have come here also. Remember back in verse 5, the Jews were the ones who were riling up the lewd fellows of the baser sort. They were getting people excited. They were causing the trouble here. They were getting everybody upset. But here they accuse of Paul and Silas of upsetting the world. Uh, by the way, the KJV refers to them as turning the world upside down. And I actually like the way they word that there. That's an interesting uh, picture. And when we think about it, I think it's a pretty nice compliment. I mean, it would be very nice if this could be said about us. Oh, wow, you're the church turning the world upside down. And that's kind of what's going on here. Any city under Roman rule could govern themselves as long as they kept things peaceful. And so if somebody back then was accused of upsetting the world, that kind of puts their self-governance in jeopardy. So this is a serious accusation in the ancient Roman Empire. It's saying... Uh, these men are causing trouble, and if this continues, we might lose our uh, right to rule ourselves. So this is something we need to take care of. Well, the next accusation is against Jason in particular. Jason has uh, welcomed these men. Jason is assisting in this. And what a compliment that is for Jason. Obviously, they didn't mean it in a compliment, but here we are 2,000 years, re uh, years later reading this, and I'm thinking... I like this guy. What an amazing thing to be said. Jason is welcoming the Apostle Paul and his companions. Um, I think it's safe to say I've known uh, some bad Jasons in my life. I've also known some very, very good Jasons. Uh, this, I think, is a very clear example of a good Jason in Scripture. So 
A lot of people don't know the uh, name Jason is actually found in the Bible, but uh, Luke is very complimentary of this man and the good that he does. Uh, the third accusation is that all of them, Paul, Silas, Jason, everybody, all of them are saying that there is another king, Jesus. So this is the Jewish leaders accusing the Christians of some kind of insurrection. It's not the truth, is it? They are not coordinating an insurrection against the Roman government. It's similar to accusations made against Jesus, right? With his trial, they kept asking him about him being another king and all that kind of thing. But certainly, uh, this is not the first nor the last time that somebody will falsely accuse somebody of an insurrection for political gain. It is a common tactic. It has been used over and over and over down through the years. In reality, is Jesus another king? Absolutely, he is. He is King Jesus. But is he a king who's trying to overthrow Caesar? Is that his mission? Is that what he came to this earth to do? No, absolutely not. Uh, Jesus is a different kind of king. Caesar is a physical king, ruling with God's permission, by the way, as we learned in our class a few weeks ago from 1 Peter. But uh, Jesus is not that kind of king. He's not an earthly king. He is a spiritual king, isn't he? His kingdom is not of this world. But these are the accusations. They've upset the world. Jason has welcomed these men, and they say that there is another king, Jesus. With these accusations, they fire up both the crowds and the city authorities, the Romans, and the result is they receive a pledge of some kind from Jason and the others, and they release them. That pledge seems to be some kind of bail or bond money. You pay us this deposit, and you might get it back if you don't cause trouble anymore. Of course, they can't help but preach and teach what they know, but this is how it ends in Thessalonica. Jason and his people put up this pledge, and Paul gets ready to move on. Our last paragraph tonight is Acts 17, verses 10 through 15. Acts 17, verses 10 through 15. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. After Jason pays the fine, the Christians in Thessalonica get Paul and Silas out of there by night. They sneak them out the back door, we might say. We think back to the church sneaking Paul out of Damascus in a basket through a hole in the city wall. So Paul, I think it'd be accurate to say, is getting pretty good at this, uh, sneaking out of cities by the back door or through a window or over the wall by night. Uh, this is becoming uh, kind of a common occurrence for the Apostle Paul. Uh, he and Silas escape. They head down to Berea, the next decent-sized town down to the southwest, as we noticed on the map there a few moments ago. And then they go straight to the synagogue, don't they, to do it all over again. They are very persistent. By the way, we don't have a reference to Luke or Timothy. Uh, notice this is not a we passage, as we looked at a week or two ago. It doesn't say that we went to Berea, but it says that Paul and Silas went down there. And the reason seems to be that Luke and Timothy have stayed behind, either at Philippi or Thessalonica. And when we think about it, they are perhaps a little bit more low profile, aren't they, than Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are out there. They're publicly teaching, preaching. They are the face of this mission team. Uh, Luke and Timothy are perhaps playing more of a support role, a little bit more behind the scenes work. And so they are continue. Uh, continuing to preach kind of behind the scenes once Paul gets kicked out, which is a neat way of, of doing this. Uh, when they get to the synagogue, it's obvious that the Jews in Berea are more noble-minded than those up in Thessalonica. That is an amazing compliment. The evidence of this noble-mindedness is that they receive the word of God with great eagerness. So they accept it, but they don't just accept it blindly. They don't just say, oh, somebody taught us something we've never heard before. Let's believe it. That's not their attitude. But instead, 
they examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Maybe about a year ago, I think it was uh, John, uh, one of our other elders who preached a lesson on the Bereans fact-checking the Apostle Paul. That's become a huge thing these days, hasn't it? And so these people, they do their homework and they find that Paul is in fact telling the truth. What he says matches up with what they know to be true from the Word of God. And for that reason, they are able to believe it. And again, this is a good habit for us today, isn't it? Whenever we hear the Word of God preached, we are to be active listeners, not just believing everything we hear, but testing and listening and comparing what we hear to the Word of God that we know. And if we hear something that doesn't sound right, uh, I would suggest pulling the preacher aside and asking about it, uh, just as Priscilla and Aquila will do for Apollos in a few more weeks here in our study coming up. Uh, one of the scariest aspects of preaching, in my humble opinion, is getting something wrong. And that haunts me as a preacher, to say something that is not right, uh, maybe by accident. Obviously, I'm, I'm not intending to say anything wrong, but from time to time, there will be a slip of the tongue. Something comes out wrong. It doesn't sound right. And maybe in the kind of the fog of the moment, I don't know, if I talk myself into a corner, I say something, something slips, and, and if it doesn't sound right, man, I hope you guys will pull me aside. And I think John mentioned something about uh, you will be his best friend if you do that. I, I would totally agree with that. So pull the preacher aside. Uh, the golden rule, it seems, would suggest that if I hear a preacher say something that's not quite right, I should probably look into that myself and then go talk to the man privately to try to clear that up and then take it from there. Um, in verse 12, we find that because they were noble-minded, because they received the word with great eagerness, uh, many of them believe including a large number of prominent Greek women and men. And I would point out here again, the women are mentioned specifically, Greek women and men. Um, and remember, in the book of Luke, Luke makes a point of including people in groups who were often overlooked and mistreated in the ancient world, and that seems to be continuing here in the book of Acts. Uh, twice in this chapter already, he has specifically mentioned uh, the women. And it's not the last time in this chapter. We'll come to that again when we get down to the situation in Athens. However, because he gets off to such a good start in Berea, word makes its way back to Thessalonica, and the Jews from Thessalonica come down to Berea. And they do the same thing to Paul in Berea as they did up in Thessalonica. They, they agitate, they stir up the crowds, they get everybody fired up. So as I see it, the Jews pretty much chase Paul from Thessalonica down to Berea. And now it is happening all over again. By the way, who does that remind you of? Who once chased Christians from place to place, from town to town, from city to city? Paul did, didn't he? Back when he was known by the name Saul. Uh, Paul had once done to others what the Jews are now doing to him. And so I think it seems, in my mind at least, that God has prepared him perfectly for this. He knows He knows the tactics. He's, as he's going from town to town, he, he's probably anticipating, this is what I would do if I were them. This is what I did when I was them. Well, when the brethren see how this is going, they also get Paul out of there again. And once again, Silas and Timothy stay behind. Again, this seems to be a pattern. And to me, it almost seems like they are uh, leapfrogging through Macedonia and northern Greece. That's kind of the way I would put it anyway. The old game of leapfrog. Uh, having multiple people on the team allows them to do this. Some are more out front. They're more outspoken. And then others kind of seem to be working behind the scenes. So that's kind of uh, what we're dealing with here. Accept chapter uh, 17, uh, verses 10 through 15. So that's where we're, we're picking up here. I think we're about ready to move on. So this gets us to the end of this. This gets us ready for another week. Uh, questions answered in Athens, the exciting conclusion. And again, if you have a better cue than questions answered in Athens, I would love to hear that. Uh, I dare you to beat me on this. And uh, I would just also, I should point out down in verse 15, 
that uh, several from Berea actually escort Paul all the way to Athens. And when he gets to Athens, Paul gives them a command that Silas and Timothy are to come down and join him as soon as possible. And to me, that's kind of interesting. He leaves Timothy and Silas behind to wrap things up. And as soon as he gets to Athens, I kind of imagine Paul being a little bit overwhelmed. So as we move into next week, um, this is a huge city, Athens is. It is just a huge opportunity. And he's thinking, I'm going to need some help with this. So go get Timothy and Silas, get them here as soon as possible. I'll get things started, but please send help and send it quickly. And so with this, they head back up to Berea, leaving Paul alone in Athens. So again, that's where we plan on picking up next week, if the Lord wills. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope all of you can be together for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11, and plan on being there for the class in between at 10. And let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, a God who is looking for people with honest and obedient hearts. As we explain and as we give evidence that Jesus is the Christ, we pray that you will be with us. We ask for opportunities. We ask for courage. We ask for a spirit of humility that we preach you and not ourselves. And we pray that we might be willing to upset the world as needed. We pray that if we say something wrong, if, if we slip up, that our Christian family will gently correct us and get us back in line with your word. Thank you, Father, for Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke and for their examples of wisdom and courage. Thank you for your inspired word so that we would be encouraged by the success of your word in some very difficult places. We're thankful for those early disciples and especially for the women it must have been so difficult for them to obey the gospel, even in the face of intense pressure and persecution, perhaps even, from their own families. Father, you know what they experienced. You know what we experience today. And so we ask for their courage. Thank you, Father, for saving us, and thank you for making us a part of your plan to take the good news into all the world. In Jesus we pray. Amen.